Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, 7D is a methodology I was practicing uh, in the last 15 years because I am a design practitioner. I am not a, a theorian or researcher. I only became researcher researcher five years ago when I came to the Technion. So what I'm going to show is more application of design thinking than uh, theory. And it's to do with nature. And this picture was taken a month ago when I was in the a research delegation, Israeli research delegation in the Galapagos. And we were diving in a beautiful site. Oh. In a beautiful site um, in one of the islands. Actually, it wasn't an island, it was a rock without any tree. And then the sunlight was shadowed by darkness. And it was unusual because there was no, uh, no clouds in the sky at the time. And I looked up and I saw this huge uh, fish kind of uh, storm behind me, or above me actually. And it turned the light off and it was amazing and beautiful. And for me, being in nature, being in diving, is something that I cannot explain. I cannot put you in words. Even this image can, cannot transmit the experience of being in this movement. Thousands of thousands of fish. So what I'm going to talk about is something that is beyond language, beyond something that we can uh, textualize or explain in words. Uh, Barbara is not here, but I really relate to what she was talking about, about the fact that the unconscious is much huge and bigger than uh, our consciousness. And we, with what we can say, it's only tapping a bit about it. And most of it is unknown to us. So my story about nature-centered design methodology is about feeling this kind of cloud uh, around 15 years ago and feeling that uh, what I was experiencing as design thinking methodologies that came at the time because I was practicing this uh, from the age where I was working in IDO office uh, at Tel Aviv and at the time it wasn't called design thinking methodology it was more about design strategy, actually. Only when it moved later on to Stanford, I will talk about it, it was called design thinking. I felt that it doesn't cover uh, what I felt at the time. So uh, specifically, these kind of methodologies that I learned didn't cover the fact that we are humans are in a context. We are part of something bigger, but we are self-centered in what we are wanting to attempt, mainly as a practitioner, is that more profit yeah, for companies, which is, this is what designers do. And whether there is a question to ask about this uh, urge to make more profit and create more products. And we are like the priest of this kind of uh, cult. Um, so something from the unconscious came 2005, and this was an exhibition in the MoMA, uh, where the title was Safe Design Takes Some Risk. And I cannot explain why I chose this artifact, because I'm, I never done anything about garments. Uh, but what I proposed this was this picture um, to the creator, Paola Antonelli. Always was a kind of a ahead of time with her prophecies. So she took this safe design takes on risk and I proposed that the fact that in critical moments you need something to protect you. And it might be 
that will be integrated into fashion. And of course, uh, uh, she accepted this and I created from it an artifact that was shown later on. Uh, at the MoMA, um, you can see it here <laughs> with this lousy picture. Uh, so something that I couldn't explain, maybe after these two years I can explain more, was saying that we are in an environment that we need to consider. Um, that can affect every one of us. So I took this word reframing I heard yesterday and I put it on this picture that was in the presentation because actually this is what I was doing. I was thinking about the fact that human-centered design was very important when engineering didn't talk uh, about the human and it was important to take technologies from huge rooms into the hands of people. But now we are over it. Everyone has this technology and any, everyone can use technology in the palm. Um, so we, this is the time to reframe human-centered design and design thinking in it. I found uh, Bela Banathi, a very important thinker, in his book, uh, Designing Social Systems in a Changing World. He uses a lot the word design and design thinking. And I found that he was actually the person who created this double diamond thing. Uh, divergent convergence thinking, surely you know these uh, phrases. Um, and he put in the middle the image of the future system, how we can predict future systems, um, how we create alternative images and then alternative solutions. And of course, you all know this uh, very well by design thinking methodologies. This is the Design Council, uh, Double Diamond. This is the IDO, uh, Double Diamond. But no one is really give any credit to Banati, I have to say. Uh, I was working in IDO uh, together with uh, Barry Katz, as a good friend, changed my design. And of course, uh, this is now the image of what design thinking methodologies are and it's created a kind of uh, stagnation because I was working with these tools 30 years ago, 1998. Um, no, not 30. 20 something years ago and it didn't change. Nothing changed in this and people, more and more people are teaching the same methodology. <clears throat> starting with empathy um, and I wanted to start with the first empathy is to my inner self because how can I be empathic to anyone if I don't know my inner self, my soul psychology and what do I feel? And what I felt is that we need to move from human-centered design to nature-centered design and it contains a lot of things one is that humans are an integral part of nature and the world. That climate change and the way various industries impact it is affecting design. The fundamental survival of individuals and widening economic gaps are part of it. Uh, the society in each country and region, the human society as a whole, and we really feel this right now as an integral part of design the different cultures, religions, ideologies maybe, the relationship between them, health and well-being, including identity, feelings, social interaction, and unseen human systems that we don't know, something that is embedded in us, maybe from previous cultures, previous ancestors, and the evolution of the spiritual path of the human race. So, I, I took a very simple analogy, and there's the analogy of the, of the culture of agriculture and permaculture, and I used the terms for plowing to harvesting, and I called it uh, 7D, actually in Hebrew it's uh, Zayn, and it's Zayn is the seventh letter, so D Zayn, you write it from right to left, it's D, out D, and Zayn is the letter and together is 70. 
So I won't go into details for um, the methodology. Start with um, components, which each one have a different uh, frequency uh, inside methodologies. So we start with plow, and plow is the framing and reframing of the thing making uh, the field prepared, and of course. Uh, using the plow to cut the ground, the ground is there are conventions. Seeds is the looking into the DNA of uh, and m mutate the DNA of the framing, reframing. Sprouts is the ideation and first ideation process. Budding is early prototypes. Flower is uh, close to real prototypes. Fruits are uh, preparing and making everything into uh, a final service or product. And harvesting is putting the effort into scale it up and go out to the world and affect the world. Um, and in the double diamond way, it might be that it's uh, adding two open diamond in the beginning and the end. And of course, I see this more as a molecule and something that you need to pick up, not as a linear thing, I will talk about it later, but more as a, as a model of molecule that you can pick up anytime you need. And how it affected myself, I decided to move out of idea all the time and, and build my own uh, studio. And I started to work at the time, 2003 to, through 2004, uh, uh, building a startup using uh, harvesting the sun uh, and making both hot water and electricity in the same device using mirrors to concentrate on a center of very high efficient solar energy. This was uh, manifested in a large scale project in one of the kibbutz uh, in Israel, Kibbutz Yavne. And after we installed this solar energy, we, uh, the kibbutz made a vine around it and inside it to make it more viable for uh, the economy. And of course, they have a pickle industry, so they use the hot water this generate because you need it to cool the 1,000 degrees uh, heat in the center, so you get a lot of hot water as an extra, so they use it for their pickle uh, industry. Another point, uh, two, two years later, I was part of an exhibition at the Cooper U Design Museum, designed for a living world. And the idea was, at the time, to think again about sustainability. And I used um, the largest uh, bamboo shoot in the world. It's like a uh, height, get to height of 15 meters. And I depicted a very minimalistic way of living, where everything you need is on these poles of bamboo, uh, including this sofa, uh, ping pong balls as a light, and speakers that relate to the one of the most ancient uh, products in the world, which is uh, a flute, which is like 40,000 years old. Of course, a small library for the books that you don't finish ever. And of course, a bar of wine. So this was uh, another direction in this uh, nature center design. Another project was using the recycled plastic. And uh, the, the reason it's recycled because it's uh, black and using uh, <clears throat> a technology to create very fast a home that can make by one week using local mud for refugees. And you can see this was in the Vitra uh, uh, area, garden. And we created this in one week, uh, the whole 20 square meter um, that cost actually double the price of a tent, but gives a lot of security, a lot of climate isolation uh, uh, to the refugees. Uh, another project I can relate to is uh, 
uh, with the vision. It's a company that uh, uses the vision as a part of its innovation. And this was a recycled, recycled plastic uh, composter that can make compost uh, very fast because it's dynamic in five weeks instead of half a year. Another application of a uh, nature-centered design process was uh, called Y7 program. It's a program that uses uh, innovation in specific areas. This was the Jaffa uh, port uh, studio of Y7. Uh, here we work with uh, uh, Arab ladies from Jaffa on social innovation and we use this in various projects uh, in Latin America, China, Palestinian Authority, and other places. Uh, another project was with, is running, still running, with the Ministry of Education. The 7D became the, uh, the methodology to use with uh, combined uh, pupils or students in high schools from different areas like uh, um, design, but also computer science <clears throat> and mechanical engineering. So we ran a, a test on 10 schools, high, high schools in Israel in the last three years. And this year is going to grow and scale up into another 20 high schools. And they use 7D as the methodology and it's going to expand. Another uh, uses of it is with all the design uh, departments. Um, uh, it's around 3,000 uh, students in high schools, and they also use this uh, methodology of 7D. Uh, a large uh, project with 7D was uh, a Colombian government mission, 2010. It was a five years project with the Colombian uh, Ministry of uh, Innovation. And we created a, a national uh, project on innovation that succeeded very much. At the time, Medellin became the uh, most innovative city in uh, 2013. Um, I wouldn't go more into it because I have only three minutes. <laughs> Uh, another uh, application for it was the uh, EIT, European Innovation um, and Technology. Uh, we used it uh, with the urban mobility um, section. We did a few workshops at a time uh, combined with Germany, Poland, Hungary, and Israel. At the Technion, 70s uh, taught right now to uh, almost 850 students that takes uh, design thinking, um, nature-centered design uh, uh, courses in an, a, a minor in entrepreneurship leadership. So we created this uh, curriculum of nature-centered design at Technion uh, for all students from all faculties and it's taught uh, right now, at this moment, uh, with uh, every year around uh, 150 students. I wouldn't go into it too. <laughs> um, and in the, the lab uh, that I opened, Design Tech Lab, we use also research that is focused in nature-centered design. And uh, this is a Kalkar. Kalkar is an Israeli typology of icon of a product, which is isolate, isolation of cold water for the hot summer. I know that you dream about the hot summer in Israel in March, but I'm really sorry. It's the last day of the rain in this year, I tell you. Tomorrow it's... <laughs> so uh, this is a Kalkar. It's a styrofoam. And it, as you know, styrofoam is not a very nice material. So our research, uh, Noah Matthias, uh, did a PhD on uh, using uh, mycelium, uh, fungi-like, of course, uh, natural material that can have isolation uh, and, of course, all uh, the material ne uh, needed. And, of course, uh, this is totally sustainable and recyclable. 
uh, using mycelium uh, as a replacement for stereophone. Another project that we are now into, and those who will choose to go into the workshop of uh, Ofer Berman, a PhD doctorate. Ofer, raise your hand. So uh, this is part of his research, as we are into um, creating, uh, forming a reef that was, uh, will enable us uh, to allocate the shift of corals into northern areas. So we create a nuclear of a reef using ceramic materials, which is natural, and but using algorithms we create a different kind of a kind of reef. This is like a, a reef that will float in the water and then shift it, collect the planulas and shift to another place. Uh, another a kind of uh, this uh, coral structure is based only on ceramic. It was uh, shown in the extreme uh, exhibition at the Hulon Museum. And it, was, it is now in the water, I'll show you later on. And of course, this kind of uh, corals was installed uh, in, the, in the sea for the last uh, three and a half years. This was the first installation. Um, after a month, we could see how it attracts uh, algae. And later on, it attracts uh, all kind of uh, plethora of um, flora and fauna. And including uh, big fish and uh, animals. Shall we leave some time for questions? Yeah, I'm just finishing. Mm. So I'll, I'll skip this. So just to, to summarize, this kind of um, approach enable us to meet uh, and and be with, uh, for example, in this project with marine biologists where our benefit as designers can bring them a lot of expertise they don't have. And I think this is the way right now I depict design to come into contact with those scientists and those who can uh, really have a collaboration with designers to solve the mammoth a kind of challenges human race right, right now have. Thank you. Thank you.